<sighs> yeah, it's 30 pounds of chain. I found this on the beach uh, in Jersey years ago after a storm. And I'll put it on every once in a while and I'll do some squats and some curls and whatnot with it. I always had this vision of hiking with it, but I never have. But you guys might get a kick out of that. This is, you see the size of this. This is no joke. <laughs> I've been all over this morning. I was out in the valley and uh, talking to people on the phone all day. And I'll try to grab my crotch a little less in this video for you. I don't know what this last week. I mean, tighter pair of boxer shorts or something there so man i need a drink too <sighs> mm. <sighs> i'm in a tough spot right now with work i didn't get a couple deposits for some projects i was supposed to start so i'm not, I'm not sure what i'm going to do but we'll put that aside um <clears throat> I'm all over the place right now with what I wanted to talk to you guys about. Uh, I I watched an interview with Vince Vaughn like a week ago or so, and it reminded me of the movie Swingers. I was like, well, I haven't seen that in a while. And then last week at the swap meet, I picked it up for 50 cents, the DVD, and I watched it. And the first half of it, I had the remote in my hand just wanting to turn it off because I'm like, I, I, hate, I don't like these people. I didn't like these people then. And what I mean by that is, I don't mean like Vince Vaughn or Ron Livingston or Favreau. I don't mean them as people. I mean the characters they were portraying. Those were some annoying dudes, man. Uh, did not like that. And it reminded me of what I went through here in the 90s. Because I, I lived that life. <clears throat> what they were doing, I was doing it. I was studying acting in uh, Beverly Hills, Nick Conti's acting lab. And I'm still friends with a lot of people who were in that class. And I was making movies. I was helping people to pr make their own small movies. And I'm a guy like that can do anything. So I would do it all. I'd drive a truck. I'd build sets. I'd star in it. All kinds of stuff. Not the star, but I'd have a part in something. And I did some extra work. I got, as a matter of fact, I'll pause this right now. I'm going to show you something. I'm going to tell you the story first. Well, no, no, I'll show you the clip right now, then I'll tell you the story. All right, this is an Opal car commercial from 1993 that I'm telling the story about. And I'm going to skip through this real quick. Uh, just get you to the end, because that's where I'm at. So watch this little bit here. Watch the background. Now you see that little headlight right there? You see that there's a little scooter here? That's me. <laughs> That's... Let's back this up a bit. That's me on the scooter with a girl on the back. That's it. Right there. That's me. <laughs> In the Opal car commercial. Funny clip that you just saw there you know a uh, couple seconds it was so crazy at the time that was my first paid acting gig I think I'd done some uh, in college that wasn't paid I did some theater and whatnot and I, I came out here and I met people and I started doing some theater and different things and I could uh, well I did I helped make a bunch of movies matter of fact there was a film shot right here in this apartment it was like a student film, this guy's first picture. He's gone on to do other things. I can't remember his name. I'll get the name of that, because i never even seen it, but I know I'm in it, because I had this goofy picture of myself hanging here, and I remember running into him when they did the premiere on it. He's like, dude, you're in every scene, because <laughs> of the picture. <laughs> Funny story about that. I didn't realize how much of a production it was really going to be here, and a whole crew was in here. And the thing about me was all these things I worked on, I always got paid. Most people didn't get paid. Most people work for nothing because they hope it's going to help them get somewhere in this business. And this guy came in. He was the producer. And he really liked me. We started talking. I looked at him. I said, you know, you look just like that kid from the movie Children in the Corn. Or Ch Children of the Corn. You look like the kid from Children of the Corn. The, the, the guy. He goes, I am that guy from Children of the Corn. I can't remember his name, but he was the lead actor in that. <laughs> And he gave me a couple hundred bucks, which was pretty cool. Yeah. And then I just started getting in the mix with these people. 
And I even worked on a film with this guy, Jonathan Siegel. His father wrote Love Story uh, from the 70s, Ryan O'Neill. And uh, I mean, I was an integral part of getting that film made. And I don't remember the name of that movie. And I think of the Swingers movie again. Uh, because, yeah, like I said, I, you know, I lived that life and I didn't like those people and I didn't like them at the time because all they ever want to talk about is acting and, and they're all blowing themselves up and it's a very boring conversation and I just got sick of it. But when I was in the mix of it, it was kind of fun and exciting. You know, the first five years I was here in Los Angeles, it was pretty wild. <laughs> And I did all this stuff, and I worked on these projects, and I hobnobbed with people. But I was going out to the Dresden Room, like they do in Swingers. And I was going to the 101 Cafe, like they do in Swingers. I used to see this actor there all the time. As a matter of fact, the guy who gets his ear cut off in Reservoir Dogs, he got, I had a role set in this movie, which Jonathan Siegel uh, directed. But they gave it to him, because he was a name actor at the time. <clears throat> And that was kind of a bummer. I hung out with Ed O'Neill or uh, o Ross O'Neill. God, the bald guy that was the the prison guard in uh, the Longest Yard with Burt Reynolds. He did a he was a character actor. And I was talking to him one day, and he brought up Lee Marvin. And I'm like, yeah, I'd love, love to meet Lee Marvin. You know, I'm a Marine. That'd be a fun guy. He, he looks at me and goes, Don't you read the papers? He's dead. He's been dead. <laughs> There's just tons of stories. My first Christmas here, I got a job and I was tending bar at a party up in the hills. Again, I can't think of the name of these people, but they had these big parties every Christmas. And uh, I'm pretty sure I told this story before. I had just gotten a manager and I had just done my first commercial, which you just saw. I'll tell you about that. And I was, so I was kind of jazzed and they had this big tent outside and all these tables set up for dinner. And I'm setting up this bar. They had two bars, and this guy comes up, and I recognize him because he used to be on The Tonight Show all the time, and he was the bartender from Chasen's uh, down there on Beverly. And, you know, I was I used to be a good-looking kid. And he comes up to me, starts talking to me, and I'm telling him all this stuff. I'm really excited because I'm starting to get some work. And uh, he's like, well, come with me. I, I need an assistant. So he takes me in the house. We walk through the house, and we go into this library kind of room. And it's books and glass case, books, glass case. And every glass case, there was weapons, you know, firearms and knives and stuff like that. <clears throat> and there was part of this section of the wall that was a jar. And it was this big garbage can filled with ice right there. And that was, you go, you'd open this wall, the whole wall open. And you walk in and it was a bar. And you look out into the, it was a giant foyer of just this marble floor and big palatial old school. It looked like something out of Gone with the Wind, you know. And there was a big staircase that roped up around. Natalie Cole was there and she got up on the stairs and sang Christmas carols. Gene Kelly was there. It was insane. At one point I'm standing by the ice bucket, but I'm still in the library room. And I sent somebody next to me and I look, it's Charles Heston. He's standing right next to me. And he looks down and he goes, hey. I'm like, what do you say to Moses, you know? And then later he had come around to the front of the bar and I'm serving him. I'm making him a drink. And I said, man, you were great on Saturday Night Live. You'd done Saturday Night Live. So I guess you could look this up and date it. And uh, he he did his opening monologue and the whole audience was wearing the ape masks and the apes come out and they throw the net on him. He goes, get your dirty stinking paws off me, you damn dirty ape. And he's like, oh, you like that, huh? And then we, we said a few more words to each other and then he just looked at me and just shut down, stop talking. <laughs> like, he had enough. He realized he was talking to a nobody. I don't know. <laughs> Met Jay Leno that, that night for the first time. Tony Danza came there. I had to cut him some cigars. And uh, at the end, they took all the alcohol away. And I'm down below the bar, and I'm cleaning up. I hear this voice, hey, hey, can I get a drink? And I look up, it's Chevy Chase. I'm like, dude, they took the alcohol away. It's a story of my life. <laughs> it's crazy. That stuff used to just happen. And those parties were fun. And that was those were A-list people. And then there's a lot of B-list people around. And then there's the adult industry. And I'm going to get into some of that because that's kind of what I wanted to get into here. But the, the story with that commercial, that little clip you just saw, this girl I was in acting class with, Emily, she was dating a guy. He was working for a production company. And he said, dude, just write your information on a card and give me a little picture. 
So I did that. They called me back that day. Is this really you? Is this what you look like? Yes. Okay. Uh, we'll hire you. So I don't remember what the date was. It was all happening pretty quick. They sent a car to pick me up. I get to this to the lot. It was uh, 20th Century Fox, I think. I can't remember what studio it was. Whatever that studio is right when you're going over Barham, there's a studio right over there. I forget which one it is. I can't remember all the studios anymore. I remember Paramount because it's right across the street. And Raleigh Studios is right over here. But I, I, I'm not doing it anymore, so it's not part of my normal thinking. Anyhow, uh, you know, I get there, and they're, they're feeding you. They're being really nice to you like you're the talent. You know, you think it's some big deal. And then they had a bunch of other guys there, and they said, okay, all you guys, there's like 10 or 12 of us, just get up along the wall there. And then there was this across from us, like 30 feet away, where there's a little rise up with a railing and... I guess everybody, the director and the producers and the people that were there for the Opal Car commercial, they're all looking at us. So I realize they're going to pick somebody to do this thing. And I'm like, well, the bubble was burst. You know, like, well, this can't be, it's not about me. They don't just want me. They just wanted the guy that looked like me. So who cares? I'm not going to get this. So I didn't give a shit. So I just started talking to the guy next to me. I'm not even paying attention to them. And they gave me the part. So that was a lesson learned, like act like you don't care or you don't need it. So that was good. And I'm thinking, okay, you don't get a script, by the way. Uh, you're just being told what to do. I don't know what's going on. I th you, you, they make it seem like this is how naive I was at the time. They make it seem like you're a big deal, which is good. They're making you feel good. It makes sense. That's how the movie business works. And uh, you get wardrobe. I met this girl. I got the job because they asked if I could ride a moped. Like, yeah, I owned a couple of them. The mopeds are the fat chick of the motorized two-wheel vehicles, right? They're a lot of fun to ride, but you don't want your friends to see you with one. So, fine. But I get there. They put me in a wardrobe. I meet the girl. They're like, you're going to have the girl on the back. And it's not a moped. It's like a vintage Lambretta, you know, scooter. And those things are kooky the way that they work. And I hadn't ridden one of those. So it was stalling out. We had all these problems. And I remember we were up on the road, and I, the idea was I had to ride that thing down, but it wouldn't keep running. So I don't even think it was me. I think it was actually the, the machine. They rented it from some kid. He was there. You know, I don't know why they just didn't have him ride it. It's really bizarre. When that thing comes down, the headlight is on, but that thing's not even running. It was just gravity <laughs> with her on the back of it. And that was it. I never saw it. I forgot all about it. And I was thinking about talking to you guys about this video, and I thought, I was in that commercial. I did that commercial. Maybe I could find it. And I wrote, Opal Car Commercial, 1993, popped right up on YouTube. Crazy. February of 93 was when I was on uh, The Love Connection with Chuck Woolery. It was a two-parter. So if you guys could find that for me, it would be awesome. Uh, it just went from there. I did a bunch of stuff. I did some extra work, like I said, and I did Melrose Place, and just... A lot of little stuff like that. But then I would get more roles and I eventually got the SAG vouchers. I did a body double for Stallone for uh, Demolition Man. And, I, you know, I, I was into it and I thought uh, I could get into this. I had friends that were working and I was hobnobbing with some other actors that were had like speaking roles in movies and all that. And I just I pulled away from it. Because I just didn't like being around those people. And when you went to those parties, it was really weird, too. Because, there, I mean, I remember being at a party and talking to Kevin Klein, And seeing all these other, like, A-list people there. And maybe having a conversation here and there. And then I also remember being at some of those parties. Be like little kids walking around. I never understood that. And now, today, you look back and you're like, oh, probably dodged a bullet on that one. And there was weird conversations that people would talk about about weird stuff. And I remember thinking, well, I'm not down with that. And I oftentimes left early and I oftentimes didn't go to the party. And that's how you really get somewhere in that business is you got to show up like a big part of just getting somewhere in that business is just showing up. So here I am, I'm in LA. I'm living that lifestyle. I'm going out with people all the time that are actors or want to be actors or musicians and all that. And I got bored with being around them because it's it's a that's it's just a myopic it's just <clears throat> one subject that's all it is and everybody pretends to be nice to everybody because 
you never know where that person is going to be in a week. I had a guy moved in, two guys moved in downstairs, this Russian guy and another guy. They both worked over here at Paramount. And the one guy was a, uh, he was working as a, like an assistant to some big time celebrities. And they gave him a brand new Range Rover. He's driving a brand new Range Rover around. He's living underneath me, you know. And the Russian guy, I don't remember his name. He's a big director now. I have no idea what his name is anymore. It's probably still in my book. It's bizarre. It's bizarre, these people that you meet and then they turn into something big. I'm sure there's a whole bunch of them. I just can't think of them right now. But back then, this apartment, yesterday I was looking through pictures and I, was, I found all these old pictures of this apartment that had nothing in it. The sun is out. It was just thundering and raining. And now the sun is out. <laughs> Fucking weather here is crazy. So I had this little TV here. And I had UHF channels, and there was these uh, these two smut shows that were on. I'll never forget because I couldn't get much else on the TV. And one of them was uh, the Doctor Susan Block show. And I'm bringing this up because I'm going to tie it in towards the end here. Um, and then the other one was Colin Sleazy Friends, and this was this was an outlet for people in the entertainment, like the adult entertainment business, where they go and they do these interviews, and it was a lot of sexual nonsense. And as a young guy, I was I was curious about it. And I was running into some of those people from time to time. I'm bringing this up because I'm going to end up talking a little bit about Ron Jeremy. And the reason that all this happened was, you know, I was sitting here all week. I watched Swingers. I kind of wanted to talk about that and my time in the 90s, which I've abbreviated. <clears throat> Probably get more into that in a minute. And then uh, I was watching Kill Tony. So every Monday night on YouTube, if you're looking for something to watch, watch Kill Tony. It's a live, it's two to three week delay. They're shooting it at uh, in Austin at Joe Rogan's Comedy Club. But, excuse me. Uh, a dream fantasy of mine would be to go there and get pulled and do a minute and get interviewed. I think I'd be good at it. And I've been working on it too. <laughs> that would be a dream. But the odds of you getting pulled is, you know, a couple hundred people a night, whenever they do that, sign up for it. But they had some guy on, I don't know who he is, Violent Jim or somebody or... Fuck, I don't know what his name is. He's wearing like clown makeup, like white and black clown makeup. He's in a band. Uh, he doesn't do comedy, but he did. They let him go up and do like a shtick. He got, basically told some stories. And then in the interview process, Ron Jeremy came up. And he's like, I don't like that guy. I never liked that guy. And all of a sudden, I was flooded with these Ron Jeremy memories. And I thought, I'll talk about that a little bit. And that that side of Los Angeles and these people in the adult industry and my dealings with some of them, because it's pretty funny. I think it's funny. Uh, you know, I'll just cut to the chase on this. I never did a porn, you know, but I knew a lot of those people. Funny thing about that is I used to do a lot. I still do like remodels and whatnot. And some of these old houses, they have, this wavy old glass. And so if you're going to make a, I used to make custom windows, everything. <clears throat> and the, you'd have to use this wavy glass to match what's in the house. And there used to be a place here in Hollywood called sunshine, sunshine glass. And the woman who owned it, she passed and her daughter used to work with her. her daughter's name is Aries. And Aries was this, you know, pretty good looking, tall, redhead, big, real busty and sweet. She was kind of keen on me. I suppose I didn't really pick up on it. And then one night I ran into her at the three clubs, which again, that's mentioned in swingers. And we used to go there and hang out there all the time. Just this little graphic. Some of this, this is going to be more of an adult story. So, cause it was such a bizarre thing with her. I'll just, you know me, I, I probably tell you guys more than I should, but I remember I ran into her there. I had a few drinks in me. She had a few drinks in her. She sticks her tongue down my throat. She's like, take me to your place. We get here. We go in the room. She pulls my pants down off, throws me on the bed, throws my legs over, and goes right into my ass where her tongue <laughs> this is kind of too much. But that had never happened to me before. And I'm like, oh my God. It was pretty wonderful. It was <laughs> and she used to produce porn. So she was always talking to me about this. And the, the, like, oh, you should do it. And, and we would hang out with these people. She'd take me out with these porn people. I remember one night I had this guy... Tony Tedeschi was his name. He was sitting in the truck with us. I had this old 67 pickup. 
and we're doing the strip joints and they're taking me and I'm meeting all these porn people. I don't, I, I could care. I was making fun of them to their faces. We're driving down Hollywood Boulevard and he's like talking, telling me all these awards he's won. Like, oh, I got an award winning actor in my truck. Like, ooh, it was stupid and silly to me. But the interesting thing is, it's not so different from YouTube. Uh, if people watch you all the time, there's a certain level of, uh, I, fame's not the right word, because it's not, I mean, infamous, I suppose. But, you know, you get a, a following, and they see you in a certain way because they see you on a screen. And those people, they have a whole other world that where people praise them. They're just having sex on camera for money. I, I, I never, it's a weird thing. And and you guys are here because of Sarah, a lot of you, right? And Sarah was a nude model. She, I don't think she's ever done any porn. Uh, but the reason I reached out to Sarah initially and we became friends because it was when I saw her on Cheap RV Living and she said she'd done the nude modeling thing. And I went, oh, I know exactly who she is. I didn't know who she was. But mentally, I kind of knew because I dated a bunch of those girls here in town. That, that's what they did. Nude modeling for college classes and things like that. There used to be this thing downtown here. A bunch of girls I knew through the guys I rode motorcycles with. They had this thing. I think it was, it might have been Tuesday nights or Thursday nights. And so they have all these artists show up. And they have a band and, and a bar going and everything. And you go in there, there's naked chicks walking around being photographed and painted and everything. It was pretty cool. I remember I, one of them was just super attractive and, you know, pretty naked girls. That kind of works for me. So <laughs> I remember we set up a date. She takes me on a date. It's a 4th of July party somewhere in the valley. We get there. Everybody's naked. And we went there with another couple. And I just met the guy. He was cool. Next thing you know, we're naked. That's what you went in Rome. Everybody's naked at this party. Everybody's in the pool. We're in a hot tub. It was bizarre. It's for, imagine being on a fir the first date you go on with somebody, you get naked. It's bizarre. But that was just how it is. It's crazy, man. So, you know, I had all these bizarre experiences. And, and funny story here, too. I did this play. It was called The Coils of Death. And... I was hired initially to design and build the sets. And one of the actors worked at CBS. And so he had a, a he had got us a space there to rehearse. And so the, the woman, one of the women that lived here at the time, Deb, she was a co-writer and co-producer on it. And I was the handy guy here when I first moved in. So she knew I could make stuff. And she goes, we need a guy to design, to build the sets. So I said, well, let me go to your rehearsals. Uh, and see how you see what the blocking is like. And I knew all the terminology because I did theater in college and I was already studying here, doing the acting thing. So I understood the world, and but I never built a set before. So I get there and first thing I realize is they don't have any design. So now I got to design it and build it. And I'm watching the blocking, but now I'm making notes on the acting. And after the rehearsal, it was Deb and I and these other two guys. So one guy was John Goodwin. He had been a Hollywood makeup artist for years. hes You'll see him in the opening scene of the film Tremors. He's one of the road workers, the big guy with the big nose and the mustache. They get killed right off. That's John Goodwin. And then my friend Jeff Clinkenbeard, who's a writer, you know, tall gay guy with curly hair. And he was a writer on Frasier at the time. And so I met him. I had a meeting with him over here at Paramount. And he liked me right away. You know, who could blame him? <laughs> I was a cute kid, I'm telling you. And uh, so I'm sitting there and everybody leaves except for those three people and me. And I said, listen, before we get into it, I hope you guys don't mind, but I made a couple notes on the acting. And they looked at me and uh, Jeff says, would you excuse us for a minute? And they all went out into the hallway. They come back in and they said, well, listen, how would you feel about being an assistant director? <laughs> so here I am. I've been in L.A., just a few months. I'm already getting some work. I'm already studying. And just things are just happening. So I'm, I end up designing and building the sets. I'm the assistant director. When we get, we're at the Attic Theater. It doesn't exist anymore. It was over there on uh, Santa Monica Boulevard. Theater Row. It used to be a theater row there. 
and uh, we do this the show. Well, now I'm also the stage manager, and then in the first scene, and this is what I was going to get to, uh, you know, with more of the adult stuff again. The first scene we had the two people get killed every week, and we we, we had a Playboy playmate every week, a centerfold, and I went out with two of them, and. Uh, so we would s switch that role. But for several weeks, I did that first role. The guy who was the star of the production, Joel, I, my man Edwards, I think his name was Joel Edwards. And Joel had done uh, a bunch of uh, those Playboy Wet and Wild videos. And uh, Joe sa uh, Joel says to me, he says, Mike, you could do that. I mean, you got the physique for it. You're, you know, you're a cute guy and everything. So he sets me up with these guys over at Playboy that's called Michael Trachillis Productions. Recently, I stumbled upon the, the paperwork they gave me. I still have it. It's over at the shop. <laughs> it's really funny. And um, I guess this whole video is going to be about, like, adult stuff and nudity and whatnot. Because it's just funny to me that this stuff kept happening. I went over and had this meeting at Michael Trachilla's Productions. And a great interview. And they love you. I'm like, man, you great personality. You, got, you seem like you can handle this. And you know, you're already studying. Uh, I'll tell you what, why don't you go in the other room and strip down to your underwear for us? <laughs> I was like, I was like hmm. you know what, I'm going to think about this a little bit more. <laughs> I just wasn't comfortable with it. Mm. Me, the guy, I'll just get naked at a party. You know, first time I met Sarah, she walks out from behind her truck out there saying not a stitch of clothing on. Within an hour, I'm naked too, and I was naked for almost five days just with a bunch of strangers. Like, that doesn't phase me that much. But to strip down just to your underwear so people could take pictures of you in that c c scenario just didn't work for me. <laughs> it was, I just wasn't comfortable. It was funny. Yeah. So, <clears throat> uh, jump to uh, these other scenarios that were happening around me and these people I, were meet I, I was constantly running into. I had something in my mind. There was another story I was going to tell you, and I can't think of what it was now. So, you know what? Maybe we'll make this shorter, unless it comes to me. Give me a second. I remember now. It was because uh, I was building all these sets, too. And I'll, I'll tell you guys a quick story about doing something for Playboy. I did this thing. I had to build these sets for a photo shoot. And it was like older women. They didn't, they weren't calling them milfs at the time, I don't think, but because you know it was Playboys, they were a little bit more classy. Um, but I remember I had to put this stage together. So it's a metal structure stage that's super rigid. It was pretty large, and we did a bathroom set on it with a claw foot tub and everything. And then we lifted one end up of it, so the whole thing was pitched. And the shot was the girl's taking a bath, the water is overrunning the tub, she's obviously naked in there, and the water's running down the floor towards the camera, and I don't know what they were doing, if they were panning up, and that was the whole thing, but the thing was, was my job was to build that stage section and um, put the parts together to make it look like a, a bathroom, and that was it, I was on set, there was another part to it too that I'm going to tell you about in a moment. And the grips, or whoever, art department, I don't know who was responsible for it, but someone was responsible for collecting the water. And so they were, had a gutter going across the bottom, and it was supposed to flow off. That was not my job, man. But I'm there. I'm hanging out. I'm on set. I already did my job. And I'm hanging out, and I'm looking. There's wires running everywhere, and there's water everywhere. And I walk up, and I'm interrupting. You know, I go up to the first AD, and I'm like, hey, man. You got a serious friggin' problem brewing here. You got wires, electrical, everywhere, and it's all sitting in water. You got to fix this right now. He's like, oh, you're right. As I say that, the girl gets out of the tub. She's right here. It's not even 15 feet away. She's out of the tub. She walks. It's a, it's a, it's a vinyl floor. <clears throat> she steps off onto the, the, the stage floor. Well, she starts getting shocked. Doesn't have a stitch of clothing on. She's like, ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> I run in to sweep her up, to pick her up, to take her off the thing. It was the craziest thing, man, carrying this naked lady around who's getting shocked. And and then another thing happened. I built this other, it was on the same stage. It was over here. I built this long tunnel, and it was flats. Flats are these walls that we build. They're like four by eight walls. 
and they're made out of one by threes and skin with quarter inch luon. It's like a plywood. And we had these set up pitched like an A-frame and they were very, it was very long. It was like 20 feet or more. And uh, we tapered them down to, for a forced perspective. And then we had real grass, sod. And then I drilled all these holes and we had these domes in there with different color lights shining in it. If this sounds familiar, if you've ever seen this, I'm the guy who made that. It was probably appeared on some Wet n' Wild video or some Playboy video back then in the 90s. And so the idea was this girl, she's completely naked and she's got like high heels or boots on or something. And she's got to run down the grass. And then she, when she gets to the end, she's got to step away and turn to the left. Well, it's sod and it's wet. And I'm looking at this and I'm like, I don't think this is going to work out the way they think this is going to work. <laughs> it's not my job to say anything. She runs down this grass, man. And she gets to the end. As soon as she steps on the stage to make the left, bam, because her feet are wet now. And they slide out. She goes up in the air, feet in the air, and come. Bam. And she gets this giant raspberry going down the side of her, this big old bruise. And I'm thinking, this is this is like fly-by-night crap, man. Like the way that they get things done. I can't tell you. That's just, I'm only telling you that because it involved naked women. And that seems to be, like, I think this is going to be the theme of this <laughs> video here. <laughs> so, all right. Now, years go by. I've been to some pretty wild parties, you know, hot tub parties. All matter of fact, this thing, the Derby Dolls, came along. So I had this friend, uh, I haven't talked to her in years, and she was pretty cool, <clears throat> Wendy, real cute. And she was palling around with us with all the motorcycle guys. The motorcycle club was called the Cretans. They're still around. They're good guys. Most of them are pretty good guys. So I was riding around with them, and uh, several of them or a couple of them were going out some of these girls and so we're all kind of just got bonded together. And uh, Wendy and her friend decided to start the roller derby thing here in Los Angeles. Uh, her and her friend Rebecca. And I didn't know about Rebecca at the time. I just knew Wendy. And they made it happen. And while it was happening, she kept telling, Mike, you got to come by. You got to check this out. And eventually they got a space <clears throat> over near downtown. And uh, it turns out the Cretans ended up with their clubhouse on the roof of this building. And that was the best few years, man. That was a really good time in my life. It was so much fun. But the I, I wasn't interested in it because I kept thinking of roller derby like I saw it as a kid. These big burly, you guys know the roller derby queen song with Jim Croce? Roller derby queen. Look that one up and listen to it. It's, it's very funny. And... uh <laughs> I, uh, I it just, just because of that, that was the version I had in my mind with these jumpsuits with girls fake fighting, like wrestling and everything. She's not Mike, you got to show up. So they were going to have their first scrimmage and I went to it and I was blown away. First of all, so many of those girls were just, you know, hot and they're wearing mini skirts and fishnet stockings. They got their pads on, but they're dressed pretty hot thongs on and everything. And there, there were, it was a wild scene, man. And so I said to, to uh, Wendy, I was like, you know what? This is not what I thought it was. I, it's kind of cool. Do you, need, do you still want me to help you in some way? She goes, yes, please. They didn't have anybody to run their security. And everybody knew me, Mike, the Marine, and, and uh, some of them knew my history a little bit. I don't volunteer a lot of it. But I did, I was a security forces Marine. That that's, was my job, was security. So I did that. I ran for the first season. I ran their security. We never had any problems. Uh, the thing was, was that I didn't get into it because of the girls so much, but boy, did that become a thing, man? Uh, because those girls were like any other professional athlete, you know, after a match, they want to pound some beer and fuck. <laughs> that's, that's all it is. It's all there is to it, man. And it's funny because this is where I learned that uh, some of the best sex you're ever going to have is with a lesbian. <laughs> I'm, I'm outing it now. It's been 20 years, so I don't mind sharing this. And some of them might see it. But it's the funniest thing because a, a lot of those girls identified as lesbians. They were married to other women. They had women as girlfriends. Not all of them. Not even the majority. But a good percentage of them. But I mean probably something like eight of them that were identified as lesbians literally jumped me, man. 
And every single one of them, uh, it was the same story. It was, uh, they swear you to secrecy. Like, you can't tell anybody. Nobody could know this. <clears throat> so, okay. But it was pretty wild. Not all those instances were pleasant. Uh, you know, I can tell you, that we'll talk about that another time. But that was fun. And these were, we would have these hot tub parties right down the road down here. This one guy's house, he was married. And his wife was a, a derby doll. And they had a hot tub. And I'm that guy. So if, if they're, <laughs> sorry. But if it's a party and people are drinking and we're all having a good time. And there's a hot tub, and it's kind of, everybody knows what's going to happen here. I'm like one of the first guys. Like, I'm naked, I'm in the hot tub, and I'm having a drink, and I'm going to smoke some grass, or a cigar, and I'm going to have a good time. And that's how it was. And uh, I remember one funny thing one night coming out of the hot tub, and I just, my feet went out from underneath. I'm completely out of a stitch of clothing on. My feet slide out from underneath me. I go, it was like a cartoon, up in the air, and bam, wet slap sound with my back and body. Everyone's was like, are you okay? I'm like, I'm fine. I'm just waving at everybody. Everybody's standing around you naked. <laughs> it was the craziest thing. Those were good times. Now, one of those girls and I became friends, Lauren and uh, Laura. It's funny because she had a derby name, and she's got this name, Laura Lee. She's very attractive, very busty. And Laura and I became pretty cool, tight friends. And I used to photograph her all the time. And uh, she's a dominatrix. That's another thing. I dated a couple of these girls that were dominatrix and, and uh, did some things with them uh, where they were being paid. It's a, you know, I don't know if I want to get into that whole story, but that's, I did some one, uh, some wild stuff with those girls in that world, that adult world. And it was fun. Nobody's getting hurt. And uh, anyhow, so Laura and I are pals, and she would go up and down and wait, and she had this funny thing she would do from time to time where she wanted me to photograph her while she was going through this weight change issue for, like, awards, like these contests. I don't know. And I think one of the reasons that we were cool was that she knew I didn't care about what she did. I wasn't, like, uh, it wasn't titillating to me. The, the problem for women, uh, attractive women in general, but if they're in the business, if they're in the adult business or whatever, you you know, the kind of guys that w typically would come around, they're like, Ooh, I'm not that guy. I could care less, man. I could care less. It's I only care about who you are as a human being. If I like you as a human being, I don't judge you. I don't care what you're doing, you know? And so... She posted something on Facebook. This goes back to 2015. I looked it up. I just found the pictures the other day. I'm going to share a couple snapshots here with you. I had to get take pictures of the screen of the computer because I could not get them to upload from my other computer to the hard drive and get them to work on this computer. It just would not work. So I opened up and I took some pictures of the screen just to prove the story is true. Because I know I got doubters out there. <laughs> uh, so Laura says... She's going to be on the Dr. Susan Block show. Now, you might remember, oh, I don't know, 20 minutes ago or so, I talked about the UHF channel, and Dr. Susan Block had a show there, and I would watch it. It was pretty titillating. She used to have this show, the speakeasy, she called it, and it was like downtown L.A. and some loft space, and, you know, she's a sex therapist, but she mixes in politics, and she's... a hardcore leftist, right? So that's her thing. <clears throat> and it was interesting to watch when I would watch it back then. And, you know, you're like, oh, like they're having fun. And you're a young guy at the time. And you're like, oh, it wouldn't be bad to be a part of that. And But it didn't happen. No big deal. I did run into Colin from Colin Sleazy Friends at one time. I think I was bouncing at some joint one of the joints i worked out here in town and he came in and i had a good conversation with him and he was actually pretty cool but anyhow uh here we are it's now from 1993 or so jump into 2015 22 years later right and she says she's going to be on the dr susan block show she posts this on facebook like oh She's still around. She's still doing that thing. I was, I was I'm a fan of that. That's pretty, she goes, you want to go? Absolutely. I wasn't thinking about time, but of course she would want me to go. She'd feel safe. She doesn't know anybody else there, maybe. I don't know. 
she did have a friend there at the time who passed. So I don't know, but she was very kind to let me go with her. What I didn't know <clears throat> was that she had to get me in. And to get me in, she told them that I was her photographer because I had shot her. I've got a lot of cool pictures of her. I wish I would have thought of it. I'm not going to put them in here because they're probably too risque for you guys anyhow. I used to shoot a lot of that. I used to shoot a lot of, I was a photographer. I still am really. But I used to make money with it. And I used to do headshots for people. And I would shoot different things for people. And I shot a lot of smut. smut. You know, a lot of girls, they wanted to have some kind of like smutty pictures mixed in with their portfolios. To just, just, just to show that there's that side of them. That was always fun. And of course, living here in Los Angeles as a bohemian in the 90s, it was... It almost sounds like a scam. Uh, in, in my mind, it almost was to a certain degree, but it was very easy. I found so many pictures. I just can't show you. I, there, I just, I have, there's so many pictures from, I forget about it, but they're all there. And I would meet people sometimes and bring them back and just shoot them. Strangers, naked in the apartment. It was crazy. And every girl was, it was just, it was just a, a fun, crazy, I'm telling you, it was, it, it, my whole life with this has been insane. It's totally unbelievable. Uh, uh, except for the people that know me that were there at the time and they know what the truth is. If you don't know me, you're like, this guy's just talking a bunch of crap. But it was, these things were happening all the time. It was nuts. So I get, I drive over there with her. We get there. And this guy, I forget his name right now. He's still on my phone. <clears throat> he says to me, he says, where's your equipment? So what do you mean? He goes, well, she said you, she was bringing her photographer. I said, well, I design and build furniture for a living. I mean, I'm also a photographer, but that's not what I do for a living. He goes, oh. He goes, well, we always have a photographer here every week. And because you were coming, we didn't have our photographer come. Would you mind taking pictures for us? So they gave me their camera, and that's what I did. So I shot all these stills. And at the end of the night, they were very happy. And then he called me a couple days later. He said, dude, you, you got the best, better pictures than we've ever had. Nobody ever shot that many and got all... Because I'm, I'm like into it. And, and just so you understand, the, it's the Dr. Susan Block show. It's a podcast now. And she's got some sponsors, like a book. She does this bonobo monkey chimpanzee thing. She's got a tequila sponsor. Whatever her sponsors are, they're going to be there. And to be honest with you, it's kind of gross. I mean, I don't mean, I'm not bad talking them. They, they seem like nice enough people, but I don't know. She has this snake with her. I mean, the snake would shit on her sometimes. Like white crap would come out of the, the, out of the snake. And they had to pause everything to clean it up. And the girls, you know, always had these girls there. They're porn actresses, you know. They got dirty feet. People are dirty. The whole this set is like it's in this apartment complex in this apartment. It's like it's not a pro setup. It kind of reminded me of the Matt Allen thing when I did the radio show there in his in his in his garage. It's like all dusty and dingy. Like you see this little thing. It's just funny how people get things to work and look okay. So uh, so here I am. And I'm in, I'm taking the pictures. I'm getting full shots and I'm getting, I'm getting behind. I'm shooting angles. I'm just, I'm getting everything. I know exactly. And I know how to frame images. So I'm really getting them right. I get the call. He's like, we would like to have you do this for us. Will you be our photographer? So I did that. I didn't get paid. They didn't offer me any money. The way I looked at it was like, well, I, all I do is sit in my apartment. <clears throat> so now I got something to do on a Saturday night. And I did it. I did it for several weeks in a row. And it was kind of fun and titillating and, you know, single guy hanging out, naked women. You know, it was funny. They did this. <laughs> I hope this video is OK for you guys because it might be going off the rails because she did this whole thing on squirting uh, one day. I mean, you guys know this. I could do a whole bit on squirt. I could talk and it would be very funny. I've already been working it out. But that conversation and my history with that, the true, my personal history with women who can uh, ejaculate like that, it's so bizarre and crazy. I have to tell that, but I think I'm going to save that to do on stage because I think it's because you, you can be kind of raunchy when you're doing that. I think it's going to be very funny and it's all true. And they're doing this whole thing and I, I 
contacted her after the show about it and I wrote this whole thing explained to her like what I learned and she was she's a sex therapist and she's giving me credit she's like you should have did it on the show <laughs> when we were doing that so I do this for a few weeks in a row and the last time I did it was for a reason and the last time I did it was uh, it was the, it was 2015 February 2015 it was their Valentine's Day show and Ron Jeremy showed up for it. This is this whole story. Everything I'm telling you is because this guy on Kill Tony mentioned Ron Jeremy. And I had this memory. Because I kind of blocked it out. It's like my Bigfoot story. When shit's fucking traumatic, you block it the fuck out. So, okay, I get there and they're like, Ron Jeremy's going to be here. Okay. Well, Ron Jeremy was a thing, man. In 2015, he was still a big deal. And if you guys don't know what happened to him, by the way, so he had a, it's so bizarre. He has this thing, a bunch of women came out and said that he molested them. And there was this court case, but now they've determined he has dementia. So he's out of jail and he's home, convalescing, I guess, if he gets better, but he's not going to get better. And the whole thing is funny to me because I used to see Ron out, I'm going backwards here, but I used to see Ron out all the time. I hung out with Ron. He would never remember. He's not going to remember anybody now. But I hung out with Ron Jeremy many, many times. And I would see him. And I used to hang out over at uh, Jumbo's Clown Room. Uh, I, I like to say I spent a couple of years in there one weekend. Because there was a around 96, 7, 8, 9, 2000, 2001. Like in that range. <clears throat> a, a guy I was friends with at the time used to work the door there. And that's at the time when I was hanging out at the Dresden Room. I remember I had a birthday at the Dresden Room one night. I'm wearing a suit and a tie, and I'm driving home alone after my birthday party. A bunch of people showed up. And I drove past Jumbo's, and I thought, oh, Chris works there. So I pull in, and I go in there with the suit and tie, and he's working the door, and I met a bunch of these girls. And, and then after that, he and I worked a lot together in the film industry. We were doing sets. We worked for this guy, Frank, Frank Adada. And uh, but it was funny because before that, I was hooked up with these big crews doing uh, movies. And uh, quick segue, sorry. Uh, the thing about working in the film industry is everybody wants to get in the union. Uh, carpenters, the electricians, the grips, the art department. And so I thought of, about doing that. But I didn't like being around those people either. I didn't like being around people in the entertainment industry at all. In the 90s in particular... And I wasn't political, really, but I'm the son of an immigrant. I've been living alone since I was 14. My dad was a child soldier. He killed commies right, from, the age of, from the age of 9 to 14. I, I heard all these stories about what was going on in Europe after World War II and how uh, the socialists would, were coming and just murdering people and everything. And I was raised by this guy. And here I am now, and I've been working alone since I was, as a kid, I was working. I always made my money. In and out of the Marine Corps. I'm living out here, and I'm working my ass off. And I'm on a movie set. And I got idiots talking about capitalism like it's a bad thing. And, I'm th and I would say to these people, like, you work in one of the best examples of a capitalistic success story. I can have an idea. And write it down. And, and at the time, you could sell. I had a guy who used to live right here. He'd sell ideas for movies, treatments, for 75 grand. Like, you could make money on an idea. And then that, that idea could be developed. And when they develop that idea, it could provide jobs for thousands of people. And then that idea is produced into a film. And then that film generates millions of dollars. That's capitalism, man. So you got people working in it, and, and the, the amount of waste in that business, just the water bottles alone, it's friggin' crazy, man. It's crazy. And the first film I ever worked on, and we were building castles and all this shit, was The Four Aces was the working title. I think it was, a, Disney was producing it somehow. We had like 15 carpenters on it or something. And at the end of the show, it all went in the garbage. I took a bunch of it, because uh, I was building theater sets at the same time. I reused that on, on many, many theater projects. Anyhow, <laughs> totally went off on the rails there. Uh we got to get back to the Dr. Susan Block thing. I don't know how I did that. I'm, I apologize. <laughs> so, right, February, Valentine's Day, and uh, 
the Ron Jeremy thing. Because because oh, the parties and seeing Ron out. I would see Ron out before that at these places, at, at parties. And this is the thing that's funny to me about him being uh, prosecuted for fondling or touching or molesting women. That was his life, man. I saw it with my own eyes before this incident that I'm going to describe to you and show you pictures of here momentarily. I would see Ron at parties. He would show up at parties, sometimes house parties. I would see Ron at clubs, clubs I worked at. And one of the things I would see happen, I saw this happen, I mean, I could probably remember a half a dozen times or so. But if I saw it that many times, it had to be happening all the time. Where here's Ron. Now here's some guy with his wife or his girlfriend or whatever, and they walk up to Ron. And I'm doing other things. I remember this right now specifically. This must have been at, it was probably at when I worked at the palace. But I would see Ron there, and <laughs> you'd see them talking. Then you would see the woman kind of hanging on him, and he'd be grabbing her ass whatever they might make out and then the three of them walk out together and he'd go have sex with this guy's wife or girlfriend or whatever that's what he did he was just a nympho if you're going to be in that business by the way you basically have to be a nymphomaniac and, and i can perform but i'm not like that i mean i can do that i suppose i suppose if somebody's i don't know i suppose i could have done it. it's not my i didn't want to do that I didn't never wanted to do that um I sometimes think about that. I made a joke to, I talked to Aries, it's been a while. But I remember I sent her a note, it was probably a few years ago. I was like, you know, if I would have gotten into the business at the time when you kept trying to talk me into it, I'd be directing by now. <laughs> and she laughed at me. She goes, you would be. <laughs> it's kind of funny. It's just the people, it's not that I'm grossed out by it. I'm, it bores me. The people, but the people in the industry bore me. Now, I wasn't hanging out with Rob, well, he wouldn't be a good example. I wasn't hanging out with like A-list people that are super, like Gary Oldman would be a good example or Mel Gibson or somebody like that, that at least I know their brain is on the same level as I am on certain things. That might be a different story because successful actors, they can be interesting people. To be good at something, to play a role correctly, you really have to put yourself in the shoes of the role that you're playing, which means you're going to learn something about people. You're going to learn a lot of this stuff. If you were really in the military and you watch war pictures and you know that they did a boot camp for two weeks, you know this is just fake stuff. It's enough for them to feel real enough to do a good performance. It's not the same thing as serving, but you have to give them something, you know? So those people who are real working actors and successful at it, those, some of those people would be interesting to be friends with and talk to. The problem with them having interesting people and friends to talk to is that anybody that they meet, they have to be suspicious of because most of the people who are coming in their lives want something from them. They want to use them and all that. And I ran into that. I've been friends with a lot of celebrities, a lot of people in the music business. Uh, they'll warm up to you. There's always kind of a standoffishness and eventually you could become tight with them. But what always happened to me with that was if they were cool with me, great. Friends, no problem. But if I'm hanging out with somebody and they're well-known and somebody else comes along and they start patting that person's ego, oftentimes that person feeds into it and they become a jerk. And you watch that transformation right before your eyes. And then it's you and them again and you go, hey man, I just watched you turn into a fucking asshole. Not cool. Well, those people don't like you telling them that. So they're going to start distancing themselves from you because you're not padding their ego anymore. So it's, they, they put themselves into this thing that's it, it's hard for them. So I, I almost feel for them. But anyhow, <clears throat> I would see Ron do these things, betting down people's wives and girlfriends. So you know what you're getting with this guy. You know what I mean? Keep in mind, at this point in time, in 2015, I don't think he was arrested by that time, and none of this stuff had come up. It might have been boiling up, and people might have been trying to look into him and been uh, uh, investigating him at the time, but I didn't know about it. All I know is, is we're hanging out. Ron Jeremy shows up. Now, again, we're at the Dr. Susan Block show. 
because I'd been there several weeks already, I had the perfect spot. I knew the right perch. I knew right where to be in the front of that room to get the right, great, good, full shots of everybody. So these photographers show up and there's a whole, there had, a, I'm, I'm, I don't want to exaggerate. There was probably eight or so of them there, eight or 10 guys, maybe a dozen. And they're just all over swarming. And you could see, I saw them all walking. They couldn't get the right shot. And they eventually figured out I had the spot. And they start trying to bully me around. And nobody's bullying me. <laughs> nobody's. Bu I'm like, hey, pff, elbow. I'm here, motherfucker. <laughs> and, they, and they were upset. But I got what I had to get. And then eventually I started moving around. And I got these shots. There's like three shots I'm going to show you maybe. I might just show you one of them. But I just remember him. Now, the girls are there. These are porn people. They know what this is going to... I'm going to use the word devolve into but they were there for this eventually everybody's naked and most of the people are fucking that's what it turns into and i'm taking pictures of it and <clears throat> and like i said i got the pictures to prove it not the full-on nudies i like i said the ones i got to show you i had to like erase some nipples and things like that so i could put them on youtube but it was insane but he's just grabbing these girls ass and they would go like this but he just he would either ignore it or if he made eye contact, he'd be looking at him like, well, what did you expect? You know? And I literally have pictures of him grabbing just, it, all it is is an ass with his hand on it. <laughs> That's what he did. Every girl that came by him, he's grabbing their asses. He, as, as Trump would say, <laughs> grabbing them by the pussy, which by the way, Trump never said that he grabbed anybody by the pussy. They were talking about those types of women that make themselves available to rich, famous men. And he said, you could grab them by the pussy. Never said he did, and nobody ever came along saying he did. There was a, a twisted thing that happened there. But that's another story. I don't want to get into that. <laughs> it pisses me off, though. So he's doing this, and then it gets even worse. It, it, so to promote... Oh, God, it's so disgusting. This is gross. Probably this whole video is gross. This is probably freaking people out way more than the video I did this past week asking you what you would do with your friend's skull. <laughs> it's all true. And I'm just telling you the story in a way that th this is my life. But imagine if I was trying to do this as a bit on stage to make it funny, you can probably see how much humor there could be here because <laughs> it's, just, it's, off, it's off the fucking rails. One of our sponsors is a tequila sponsor. It's so, it's just, I, what happened was, here I am, I'm taking all these pictures, and then what I'm about to say happens, and, I, and, I, and I'm jockeying, and I'm elbowing assholes that I don't know, these guys, and I remember thinking to myself at this moment, when this next thing I'm about to tell you happens, thinking, what am I doing here? Like, it just hit me, like, what am, why am I here? Who are these people? And, and she would always pepper in all this, she, she hated Trump, you know? And just all this just stuff. It was only 2015 at the time. But for some reason, he had come up a couple of times. And it was just a hardcore left-leaning nonsense. She would say stuff all the time. And the guy who was really responsible for getting me there, I would talk to him at the end of the night and be like, dude, just so you understand, what you guys are putting out here is bunk. It's bogus. It's nonsense. He's like, eh, yeah, you know, well, you know, he doesn't care. It's what the media does, too. They they make you fearful. They scare you with images. And then they program your mind with bullshit at the same time. It's programming. Well, that's what she does. She uses sexuality and nudity and orgies and sex and everything and gets you involved in that, if you're into, into that, watching it. I was not into it. I was just circus, circumstantially fell into it. And it was just a, a moment of time in my life. This is one of many kooky things. I've, I've done so much crazy stuff like this in my life. Along the, I, I, the reason, I, if I talk about a certain type of person or a certain group of people, it's because I spent time with those people. I've spent real time with different types of people. All kinds of cliques. Rich people, poor people. Bums on the street. Super crazy rich artists. All, doctors, lawyers, writers. All, all kinds of people in my life. I know them personally. 
and I've done it. And I've done, I, this is nothing, what I'm telling you here. I've done way crazier shit. A lot of it I can't, I would never talk about here. But anyhow, the tequila thing. They're literally putting, he's, he's dipping his fucking Johnson in salt. And the girls are eating the salt off the end of his Johnson and then doing tequila shots. That's what it turns into. And I'm taking pitch. I'm like, <laughs> and I've got the pictures. And it's disgusting. And it was disgusting at the moment. And I was thinking of it in terms of doing a good job. Because that's who I am. If, you, if I'm there to do something, you see the kind of work I do. Anything I do, I always try to do my best. I don't half-ass anything. I'm always trying to do it as good as I can do it. And that's what I was doing. And in my mind, that's all I was doing. It was funny because these girls would come up to me, you know. And because I was there in a professional way, I wasn't doing that. I wasn't. I, plus, I don't, wasn't comfortable with it. And, and it kinda, most of them kind of grossed me out. There was this girl there, I can't remember her name, really pretty blonde porn actress, right? She get she was there every time I was there at that at that time. And uh, she drank wine, but she had that thing, you know, some people, if they drink wine, it turns their teeth brown. And so, you know, she, she's on film and her teeth are brown. And she didn't show up with brown teeth, but it would do it to her teeth. And she'd come up and she was so cute and, and pleasant and nice. And she'd be like wanting something, wanting it from me. And I'd just look at her and I'd see those brown teeth and dirty feet and everything. I was like, it just, yeah, it grossed me out man. <laughs> at the time. And I'm sure, yeah, but she was probably, she was, she was a pretty sweet person, but you don't want to, I don't at that time, I didn't want to be involved with those people like that. And so here I am again, this thing with the salt on the penis and the, the shots. And I'm like, what am I doing? That was the last time I ever did it. And I forgot about it. But what I would do at the end of the night, every time was I would, I brought my computer with me every time. So I would take the, the memory stick and I would upload all the pictures to my computer. Then I'd give it to them so they could take them and do whatever. And I did that for myself because I was like, Hey man, they're not paying me. I'm going to keep all these images. So every time I, three or four times, something like that. But every time I did it, it was a minimum of 300 images, three to 600 images from the night. I do remember one time there was this woman, she's, you know, one of these porn actresses, black girl, Anna Fox, drop dead gorgeous woman. And I had seen her work before. <laughs> so I knew who she was. I don't know who these people are. I'm not a porn person. Uh, I utilize porn, like a lot of people do, but I'm not a porn fan. You know, like, uh, like who this person or that person. Like, the only names I can think of are the people off the top of my head that are people that are either, you know, back in the 80s or 90s, you would watch it so you kind of remember, or the people that were, like, household names now. Nina Hartley comes to mind. Peter North comes to mind. Uh, but these are old people. I'm old, so these are the people I remember. I have no idea who any of these new people are. But this one woman I remembered at the time because I remember seeing her and something and like, wow, she's very pretty. And there she was. That was the squirting video. <laughs> and here I am. I'm literally... It's, it is kind of gross. I know I'm grossing you out. But here I am with a camera that close to somebody who's, you know, literally ejaculating like I'm dodging it with a camera. <laughs> it the, I did that. I did that. So this, believe me, when I eventually start getting up a little bit, I'm going to talk about this and make it very funny. But you can only talk about that stuff and make it funny, I think, if it was real, you know. So that's it. This is kind of, you know, my existence in L.A. in the 90s and doing the acting thing and <clears throat> meeting these people and having these experiences and not liking being around actors to now. And, you know, the interesting thing is uh, now being older, um, I could probably handle that a lot better, you know, but I don't know that I'm, I'm, I'm not that interested in it. Uh, but if something came up, you never know because of the YouTube thing or something or when I start getting up, you never know. If somebody made me some kooky offer. I'm not talking about porn. <laughs> I'm not doing porn. I mean, in the, in the, in the, in, in what's the term? 
mainstream in the mainstream thing possibly but i've been told already that uh, by some casting people that i frighten them uh they know they can't control i've already been up for too many things i think i've told some i told the adam carolla story before the catch a contractor i have a video on that you guys can hear that story if you want to look for it um but i've been there and i've had the interviews and uh yeah, I'm not, I wouldn't be the type of guy, I don't think, for those people. But I think there's a resurgence happening right now. I think that, uh, I think we know now that the, the, the woke idea of these films are not making money. Uh, so Hollywood has to adjust. Bud Light, that whole situation, they've had to adjust. A lot of, and it's still happening. There's a lot of this nonsense people still want to believe. And it's costing companies big money. It's really hurt. The industry, the entertainment industry, financially. So there's good, and, and I think with comedy right now, I think it's the right time for more conservative-minded people to come out and make fun of it, poke fun. Ridicule is the only hope, the only chance that we have to hopefully get the country back on track. It's the only thing we have, short of killing one another. So I suppose there's always a chance that somebody could come along. Um, that might like a guy like me uh, to do something, and I would do it. It'd be fun because I could handle it now. When I was younger, I just couldn't. I mean, I, 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 you might be able to tell I, I'm not equipped with a governor. <laughs> what I think just kind of comes out. But now that I'm older, I can catch myself a little bit better. I, I got to tell you, this hasn't been a positive uh, portrayal of uh, parts of my life or that world. But I have to tell you, when I was doing theater, they were some of the nicest human beings I was ever around. They really were. I mean, just super kind. Didn't agree with them uh, on the way that they saw the world. Uh, they were very naive, I thought, in many ways. But I'll tell you, it was the early 90s. My dad had a heart attack. And I wanted to go home. And so I needed to go home and see him. I thought he might die. And I had one friend at the time. It's the guy I did the video on. Uh, this video will end a lifelong friendship. It was him. He was out of college. His brother had some money and he was working. They're both chiropractors. I was like the only two guys I could think of. I didn't call his older brother at the time. I probably should have. But I just want, I needed 500 bucks, man. I needed money to buy a plane ticket and have a couple bucks to go home. And he just hem and hawed and came up with excuses why he couldn't lend me $500. And here I was, I was working on, a, on this show, The Coils of Death. Didn't know any of these people before working on this show. And they took up a collection. I think they gave me six or seven hundred dollars so I can go home and see my father. That's who these people are. They're, they're very kind hearted per people. And, and a lot of kind hearted people uh, can also be kind of naive. You know, that's kind of why they accept and believe a lot of stuff that they do. But at the same time, a lot of those kind hearted uh, people are just, they gravitate towards the arts and that world. And, and it's good that we have that. I wish that they would understand and respect the fact that they need people like us, like me, <laughs> to defend them <laughs> and protect them. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So the unfortunate thing is about a lot of those people is they think that they're better. Or they think they're smarter or whatever, you know, until they get punched in the mouth and they realize they need somebody to protect them. You know, so it's, a, it's, it's an interesting dichotomy going on there. At any rate. I hope you guys enjoyed this. I, geez, I don't know how this video is going to go. It might have offended a whole lot of people. Don't mean to. I'm going to insert some pictures here at the end that I took from that night with uh, the thing with Ron. I'll, I'll keep it to a minimum. Just be a couple. I think I've got like 10 of them that I see. But I, I'll, I'll, put, I'll share the pictures of him grabbing somebody's ass. A couple pictures of him with, uh, with, with Block, Susan Block. There's a picture of him having sex with these two girls. But he has all his clothes on and I... Blurred out some nipples. I might pop that in there. <laughs> Just to prove to you it was there. I left out the stuff. At the end, you know, you, you can look at all these pictures. There's hundreds of them. And it starts off nice. And then there's ass grabbing. Then there's boobies out. And then more and more nudity. And by the end, there's just people fucking. There's just sex happening everywhere. <laughs> and there I was with a camera documenting all of it. 
wildlife. And it ain't over yet, man. You guys have a good night. Be kind to one another. I hope I didn't scare too many of you away. <laughs> I have, by the way, I have no problems with people in the entertainment business. I've often thought because of the way my mind is, I, I probably, maybe the, the right girl for me out there is like a reformed porn actress. Somebody doesn't do it anymore. I don't think, I don't think I can go out with somebody who's still doing, imagine that. You're going out with somebody and she's basically screwing and, the, and you know, you know, you know what's going on. And you, she comes home to you. What do you, you like that mindset, those kinds of people. That's an interesting. I'm not as grossed out about it as I am fascinated by it. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't mind interviewing some of these people. Uh, because I think my questions coming from my point of view would be interesting. I think it would bring up deeper ideas and thoughts than because when they're interviewed, they're usually interviewed by other people who have been in the industry and all that. So it's just an industry thing. Whereas I'd be asking them, you know, I have this thing when I do talk to somebody, it's like, where'd you come from? Where you been? How'd you get here? And then I hate, I get that, and then I can get more questions out of them after they answer those three. And I think that that would be an interesting thing, because I'd be fascinated about their world outside of that industry and how they navigate that. Is it like cops? You know, for the most part, cops, the only friends they end up having are other cops. So does it work out to where if you're in the adult industry, the only friends you have are people in the industry? I'd love to talk to some of these people about, you know, what they, what their interactions are with some of the people I remember, like Jeremy, like, what was that like working with him? And, uh, anyhow, I'm not going to get into that with you guys here. I'm going to end it right now. Again, thanks for being here. I hope you guys will come back. I hope I didn't freak you guys out too much. I kind of feel good that I got that off my chest. I don't feel like I need to discuss it anymore. So let's, let's shelve that whole thing now and get on to more interesting uh, and hopefully even more entertaining things later. <laughs> Some more of my life, kooky things I've done. So, uh, yeah, be good to one another. And, uh, you know, I'll catch you guys in the next one.